Maureen Dowd, writing in the New York Times recently, reported on the Holy See's um, anxiety about an increase in paganism, demonic possessions, and other evils, including yoga and Harry Potter. All threats to the law, to their millennial orthodoxy, necessitating the church to accelerate the education of bishops on the ancient rite of exorcism. A true story. It's been written that Jeff Kipnis tonight is going to address um, neither history nor biography, although I've heard rumors ranging from psychoanalysis to rope-a-dope. It's possible, even probable, that what we shall witness tonight is a sort of secular exorcism of the man known as Eric Owen Moss, an examination of the traits of thought, the trains of thought leading to the unfamiliar, an attempt to penetrate appearances with mutually exclusive interpretations. It's not impossible to imagine Kay riffing on EOM's interest in a certain, ooh, I can imagine, I think we can all imagine, with reasonable doubt, that Kay starts his collective interrogation of EOM by exploring ideas of self. It's not unlikely, though this is pure conjecture on my part, and I'm limited to my own um, knowledge base here maybe, that Kay's notion of self is informed by Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and the Lost Man. A re-examination of Alexander Kojiev's interpretation of Hegel, a premise locating the self as the struggle for recognition. A uniquely human quality parallel to survival that speaks of identity. An idea first described by Plato in the Republic as the thymus, a spiritedness, a third part of the soul following desire and reason. K on EOM's third part, self, a voice, a present, What's you, what you see is what you get. I don't think so. A cerebral logic, a private cerebral logic, questions, is our world less real than the unreal? Self, as a destiny of origin of thought, and an experience of, AXM's, of EOM's exegesis of exegesis. Self as a propensity for an enigmatic or as an, or as an oxymoronic display of the connections of non sequiturs produced within a framework where project and practice is inseparable. It's impossible to imagine Kay riffing on EOM's interest in a certain Dane's notion of selfhood, a true individuality in which the individual must stand above the crowd, in which the mass public is seen as distracting from the individual, in which solitary selfhood is essential, and authenticity in an inauthentic, in an inauthentic society. Equally plausible, Kay advancing the idea of EOM, avant-garde, or modernist architect as a symbol of heroic existence, the acrobat, the risk taker, in Frederick's end, sheepish society, a contempt not improbably a fear for man without chest, nothingness, nobodiness, Nemo, possibly a deep connection, Kay and EOMO, sharing the desire to reject all that represents convention, the normative, conformity, the limits of definitions. Ipso facto, the support for a tradition of non-tradition, being comfortable with discomfort, the irrefutable presence of a provisional unknowability. Whatever takes place tonight, and it's inevitable, though I would be, uh, it'd be possible to make a case for any number of equally compelling scenarios, that Kay will link the idea of self, personally I put my money on this one, to an insatiable desire, or is it a critical optimism generating intoxication? FN's excitability of the entire machine, coupled with spontaneity, the Latin word sponte, of one's will, characteristics not impossible to attribute to the work, the writing, and the conversations of EOM, and possibly the more advanced and subtle shadings as told by Kay. 
I don't know much more than I told you tonight, and it's difficult, if not impossible, to say anything more definitive about Kay's possibilities with any reasonable certainty. But what I said said, surely have, um, you shouldn't ignore, and then it contains some amount of truth. If impossible to verify, let's hear what Kay has to say about this. Jeff, your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, about six months ago, I had a birthday party, and uh, the invitation was supposed to say, um, you're invited, um, presents are required. But uh, Sylvia wouldn't do that, so she made it something like, presents are welcome. And so Tom, I just got my present from Tom. I thought I'd open it for you. I'm showing you this because it has an incredible, a powerful um, and salient effect on me, so I encourage many of you to give me presents as well. <laughs> I'm not waiting 60 more years. Good thing I finished with Tom. Very nice. Thank you, Tom. It's really beautiful. It's also upside down. There it is. <laughs> Only an architect draws an arrow on a drawing like that. Okay. Uh, Clued slightly that uh, I would have the head and brain of um, Eric in my hands. Uh, this is actually an incredibly stupid thing to do to volunteer stuff like this. I don't, don't ever do this. I used to do this and I thought, uh, uh, you know, you get paid to do it, and then you like to do it, and then I um, run a thing at the, you know, we're here for thesis. This is supposed to be part of the uh, three-day affair or two-day affair with how we situate the continuing drama and comedy of thesis at SciArc, and uh, started with drama, and I'm hoping it will end with comedy. Um, and, but at the same time, I, also run a program at Ohio State where we invite one architect to come in and uh, we do a close, the students do a very close reading of his work over a quarter and uh, then we have the professor come in and present his self and his work to those persons and submit to their questions and um, for years uh, I've been teaching this and uh, in order to teach it I have to prepare. Um, I didn't I took five years off. Uh, when I came back, I just now came back, and I thought, you know, I, it's time to actually take, give myself a challenge and address a body of work that I've always been intrigued by but have never actually had the uh, courage to approach. And so uh, I did that, and this is going to be the result. So one thing I can tell you for sure is that I will not give you definitive conclusions. Um, but I will have some, a few things to say. The, uh, um, in anticipation of, uh, sorry, I've been talking to myself all day long. I feel like I'm answering myself. So. In anticipation of um, Tom's introduction, I wanted to show you this film, just a little short film. This is To Be or Not To Be speech by Olivia.
not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep. A chance to dream. Um. I don't know if you follow Shakespearean performance scholarship, but this is one of the key moments in the history of Shakespeare. Um, sorry, Olivier is a student of Gielgud. Gielgud has mastered iambic pentameter as a modern declamatory style. It produces an incredibly beautiful and highly formalized and virtually contentless Shakespeare. Um, Olivier reads Freud and decides he's going to do a Freudian interp because of Freud's comments on Hamlet's Oedipal conflicts, uh, Olivier decides to do the first Freudian performance of um, Shakespeare and what you see as a result. In order to do that, he has to completely rewrite the scene and completely change the staging. In fact, uh, in the actual text, Hamlet is on stage, um, Claudius and the bad guy uh, Polonius have just walked off stage. They're clearly within earshot, and um, Ophelia is standing within earshot. And he gives the speech. And what's very interesting is Shakespeare's scholars are fairly well agreed now that the speech is what was called at the time a false soliloquy. It's an Elizabethan trope in which a someone on the stage gives what appears to be a soliloquy, expecting it to be overheard, knowing it'll be it overheard to an advance a plot. And in fact, the to be or not to be speech is one of those. What's more interesting is that we see this as a speech of incredible introspection and self-examination. Uh, also, I think agreed now but by art historians and um, psychological scholars of the period, is there really was no such thing as the self at the time Shakespeare was writing in the way we understand it today. Um, Rembrandt's self-portraits that we refer to as self-portraits, he never called them self-portraits. The only one that even refers to himself at all is called Portrait of a Man by an Artist. They were, in fact, tronies, which were gimmick paintings intended to sell. And so it, it's at the 1600s, which is the time that both Rembrandt is painting and Shakespeare is writing, there is no such thing as an idea of the self as we use it today. Yet we go back and we read these histories from the point of view of confirming them. So we have Freudian interpretations of Shakespeare um, and profound insights into Rembrandt based on our idea that there is such a thing as a self. Now, our idea of the self starts to develop in the 18th century and continues into the 19th century, takes, uh, gets formed primarily in the 19th century. And so the point I'm trying to say tonight is we want to, I do want to discuss this question of the self and architecture's relationship to the self, and in particular, an idea called the contingent self. Um, but the most important thing to recognize is that it is not a thing, a metaphysical thing that's always been there as we know it, always has been, always will be. It, it wasn't there. It has developed. It's probably on its way out. Um, probably accelerated on its way out by virtue of Eric's work, I will. Uh, argue. So let me begin the presentation. So uh, Olivier has completely changed everything about it in order to support this idea of the self. Wait. Okay. So let's look at Moss PowerPoint. Uh, thanks to Todd Gannon, I, have came, I came across this picture. Uh, this is called the California School. Uh, it's a very funny picture. Uh, I think you can recognize everybody in it. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to walk away. 
Um, Frank and Tom are obvious. Fred Fisher, you may or may not know. Um, Craig. Uh, Coy Howard is hilariously funny. Um, Robert Mangurian. And the guy with the white tie on with uh, Uncle Sam is Michael Rotundi, as you can see. We already have a pretty good idea that the contention itself is part of the California school. Why I think this is fantastic is that this looks like a bunch of guys that knew who they were, knew what they were going to do, knew that they were, in a certain sense, a future, part of the future of architecture. What this really is a picture of is misfits. It's a picture of people that no one particularly respected, that were not doing that, that well in the various institutions they were setting, that got together to form a kind of bohemian demimond based on arrogance and presumptuousness and the fact that nobody else in the world would recognize their important qualities. And uh, I, I have done close studies of virtually, well, not all of them, but many of them, Tom for sure, Frank for sure. I'm in the middle of an impossible one on Coy Howard, which I wish I had never gotten started on. <laughs> um, and, and the one that, that, the one that I really just didn't know how to start and finally just decided to do was Eric. And so tonight's what we're going to do. Now, Eric, I will not show a biography. I will not try to tell you what Eric says. Um, I will not explain the work, I don't think, as Eric explains it. He's a very good explainer of the work. He turns out to be an exceptionally compelling teacher. And if anything gets said tonight that I think is important to remember is you'd be a fool to come to this school and not to force you to teach him, force him to teach you. Um, the, the students were riveted. He covered an incredible range of material. Uh, he situated his work uh, intellectually, politically. And I found, found it really profound. But he does love to show this picture. and. Then when he shows it, it's one of my favorite sculptures by Henry Moore, he says something that kind of always disappoints me. He says, and when we look at this picture, we've, we have four things to say about it. It has an outside, outside, an inside, outside, an outside, inside, and an inside, inside. Like he's got four layers of surfaces and they have an interesting spatial relationship, as if he was some kind of formalist. In fact, this is a really exception. This is a, I'm not sure if this is a person who's so afraid of the world that he's armored himself against it or sees the world as a kind of existential battle. But I think it comes the closest thing I know to a picture of Eric Moss um, and not a formal analysis. And so it's the one thing of his I decided to borrow from his work. Now, uh, the other thing I want to address is something that's not just uh, Eric, that architects more and more and more and more are doing this and it's really irritating the shit out of me. Um, here's his presentation, a brilliant presentation of the design of the uh, Queen's Museum, a competition he won. Uh, I, I think we have concluded, Eric and I together, he's won a, a considerable number of competitions, not one of which has ever gotten built. I think he has the largest number of wins never to get built. <laughs> uh, and actually, I suppose I'm attracted, according to Elena, I'm attracted to that. Um, the misfits. But here's how he presents it. So here, there's where the museum is. He does an incredible analysis of Le Corbusier and uh, Sterling, and he makes an argument that, that their, their, simply their circulation diagram is a kind of political, what was the phrase you used, remember? A political something or another, political, it was a rethinking of the institution. It was a kind of political, I forgot the word, but it, it, it was a, social and political thought based on the circulation about how you would go into a museum, see the material and, and leave, and instead of going in and coming back out. Or, so he just, he recognized in the route itself, just the route through the museum, a, a really important consequence. And he decided to use something like that at the museum. So you get it. So he, on the top, there's the existing condition. He breaks it in half. He sets up the circulation. He puts the program in and then, that thing right there on the right comes down, which is this big, bubbly piece of glass. Not one word. Not why should it be a big, bubbly piece of glass. What does it mean? Is it about the view out? What is it? 
the Marinsky Theater yet to come? I mean, what actually is it? And so there is increasingly a tendency in architects to give the rational reasons for their work and not undertake the questions of what they were having in mind on what I think are the most salient and po uh, poignant, component, poignant components of the work. Um, now, the other thing is, I think, uh, the influences, virtually no architect I know will admit to any influence whatsoever of any other architect that's less than 200 years old, although, um, or occasionally in a different country. But Eric was part of that school, and I, I, I think um, two things are important. There is an important difference between the East Coast School and the West Coast School, at particularly the time of development. Eric is in close association with these architects. There's a really interesting set of relationships between Tom Main, Frank Gehry, um, uh, actually I include Wolf Pricks, um, and I just, I thought I'd show some of these. So this is the, and part of that has to do with, on the East Coast, the, uh, all of the misfits on the East Coast got kicked out of school, got kicked, lost their jobs much like they did here, but then they formed something called the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies. So they actually got, a, they got an institution that they gathered themselves under with an imprimatur, and then they decided to produce a coherent school of thinking. And you know those five architects and the consequences of that. Here, um, there was not that. Everyone stayed slightly by themselves, but in, con but in friendly uh, conversation, and you know, informal influence on one another. I would say that most of us distinguish the West Coast School and the East Coast School at this point in time on the basis of two, of one issue. The West Coast is particularly interested in part to whole relationships and continues to be interested in part to whole relationships. And the East Coast becomes interested in something called the rhetorical figure. Um, that has a lot to do with the fact there's no building going on, particularly in the East Coast. There's more building going on here. Um, so, the theorization of that becomes linguistically based on the West Coast, I mean, on the East Coast. Um, this famous drawing by Tom, which is the drawings of all the parts of the two, four, eight, six, eight house, which is this house. Um, the Sixth Street house drawings in which he goes out and finds 10 completely random pieces of stuff, brings them in, makes a necklace out of them, and organizes an entire house around that. Um, and then I show occasional places in Eric's work where I think there's some interesting resonances between the two. Um, oftentimes, Tom will have a project that doesn't have enough parts in it, so he'll invent stuff to put in it so he can get some parts in it. Um, the difference, however, that I discovered, I think, uh, and I want to explore the part the whole relationship in relationship to the rhetorical figure a little bit more, but one thing is kind of interesting is Tom, Frank Gehry, um, Wolf Pricks, they, as their work developed, they formed very coherent projects. And I, it, take, it took me a little while to figure out each one, but I think I'm pretty clear on each one. Uh, and I'll go over them. Tom, for example, is really interested, it's not in a kind of high, it's not a difficult whole, it's a difficult confederacy of parts that actually works together in an organic, not machine-like way. But he is very interested in engaging a specific set of circumstances with a complexity that he thinks matches those circumstances and gives them realization. Frank, also starting off with lots of parts and you know, incongruent relationships, and, a, and interestingly enough, a preference for the part to the whole, um, which is Many people that are outside of architecture considered one of the defining features of modernism, a preference for the overtone to the fundamental, a preference for atonality to tonality. But Frank is super interested in new ways to be contextual, new ways to be contextual that stand outside of the received canons of how one behaves contextually. And so this is a typical European corner solution with an onion dome solution that's negotiating the two, difficult, the two different facades on either side. And so actually if you analyze this, this is a highly classical corner solution to the problem, but in another language. And eventually he develops what we know is this kind of uh, way of actually connecting profoundly different um, uh, situations in a context with 
the supple form technique. So it's fairly clear that the high rises are reflected in Disney Hall by the tall towers in the back. And all of the curvatures, 100% of the curvatures in the building are derived from the Dorothy Chandler Mu Museum. Um, Wolf Pricks is obviously not part of the California School, but he, this I think this was his influence works. Plus, right after this project, he came here. He spent quite a bit of time here. He came here to build the open house. Uh, he became friends with most of these guys, am I correct? Um, there was a lot of dialogue among them. And he, too, is a person who is less interested in something called a rhetorical figure, which we'll look at in the morning, than, than the tradition of part-to-whole relationships in architecture. Now, part-to-whole relationships are really important for several reasons. Uh, they have to do with construction. Uh, I guess one thing I didn't mention, for example, on the East Coast is, and, and the West Coast is weather. Because of uh, East Coast weather, you can't use exposed structure. On the, on the West Coast, occasionally you can. So the, the reasons that that developed, I think, are particularly interesting, but the consequences of the development, I think, are even more interesting. Uh, you know, and so it's, I think it's fairly, it's fun to find these sort of interesting moments where they seem to be similar. This is the open house. Now, uh, I, I just decided to pick one of these things. One thing you can find in every one of these figures is uh, an extraordinary consistency over a long period of time about how they approach the work. Now these are four, I just picked this one because I happen to have it easily. These are four key projects by Co-op Himmelblau and Wolf Bricks from 68 to Lyon, which is 2000. They look incredibly different. They look like every project he does, he does differently, which is something architects like to say a lot. Uh, not Eric, actually, but, um, but if you notice, for example, in the Cloud project, or 68, um, it's almost identical in terms of the bubble and the, and the idea that you're floating in that bubble to the Leon project of 2002. The, the switchback staircase from the open house is also in the Groningen Museum and also in Leon. Um, the Groningen Museum has this incredible moment of resonance with the uh, open house, which doesn't look at anything at all like Leon, but Leon looks a lot like the open house from another point of view. And so for 40 years, you see the same stuff work over and over and over until something, until its full potential is developed and gets coordinated to a project. Now, I thought Wolf was pretty, I didn't pay much attention to Wolf Pricks or Co-op Hemelbell's work at all. I thought they were, I didn't understand why they were in the deconstructive show. They seemed to me to be sort of art architects with a, that, would work their, you know, you know, the automatic writing stuff. It didn't seem to have a real project to me until I went to Vienna. And then I understood that the situation in Vienna was such that gravity is not just the gravity, but political gravity. And that Wolf seriously thought, thought architecture could address a, the politics of life simply by freeing you from the oppressiveness of the gravities that bear down on architecture in analogy to the gravities that bear down on politics. And I think he, he's an exceptional architect. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, you have the New York School. They're doing, they're, you don't see part to whole relationships here. You don't see component construction. You see formal ensembles. This is the Athenaeum of, uh, what's his name, uh, Richard Meyer. So you can see the slip from here to here. So none of these things can be identified as a semiotic. They're not stairs, they're not, uh, component construction elements, they, they are, they're treated as abstractions, as formal abstractions, and those are the relationships that are pursued. Uh, although you can find similar kinds of arguments in Eric's work. This is probably the most famous and obviously why Peter was here yesterday. Uh, this is, has no interest whatsoever in what's a column, how does a column work, what's a column, how do you build a column. In fact, no interest in building whatsoever. It is a set of processes. And these processes are about distancing it from the whole question of part-to-whole relationships. Now, you'll remember last night that Peter said it was Alberti who argues that the part-to-whole relationship is no longer an important part of architecture. It's the rhetorical figure. The column is not something that's held up. The column is something that, I mean, for an architect, the architect is not concerned with the column. The architecture is uh, as structure. The, the architect is concerned with the column as a sign of structure. Once you're in a sign, you're no longer thinking about part-to-whole relationships. And that comes to a kind of, a, I think, a, a climax in the DAAP. This is a 
uh, addition Peter did to the School of Architecture in Cincinnati. Um, so what he does, let's see if I, can, if I have these in the right order. Oh, there's a slide missing. Um, anyway, he, there is an existing condition. There it is. Um, it has, if you look carefully, it looks like a Z. So there was a formal notion of a Z. It has a slight deviation in it here. So as he moves the Z to correct that deviation, instead of being able to move it as if there's a joint there, he, moves the, he has to move the entire figure. And as he moves the entire figure, he introduces, he introduces more um, contamination and more contamination. And so by using the whole figure as a rhetorical whole, as opposed to having parts, he, and then by not using uh, an ethos of correctiveness, he, as he tries to correct essentially a formal problem, he makes the problem worse and worse and worse, and then he leaves a record of that, and that's the end of the building. Unfortunately, after finishing this exercise, he didn't have any new floor space, and he was required to triple the floor space. So he does the exercise, that's the design for the project. He turns it over to Greg Lynn and says, you know, I gotta get some rooms in here. So Greg goes to the road, and does a similar exercise on the road, the shape of the road, treats the shape of the road like a rhetorical figure, does a certain kind of exercise, and that produces the building. And there you can see Peter's exercise, and this is Greg Lynn's extension of that. And this is all based on this idea of the rhetorical figure. Here is an example of the rhetorical figure. Is this a sentence? The world is round. Uh, does it have parts? What are its parts? Um, and does it, so let's say the sentence begins at a capital letter and ends with a period that's not there. Um, it's a rhetorical figure if, if it's indissoluble. If I do this, it's something different. This is no longer that sentence that we saw before. This is now a different rhetorical figure. And so it has to be taken, you cannot understand any of it by, how, by understanding the T, the H, the E, the words, or even the marks. And in fact, even this is a different rhetorical figure. And that's why you can see stuff like this and I can make an argument that there is no such, there is no, there is a window in Villa Savoie, but there is no window in Villa de Lava. There's only the quotation of Villa Savoie. Now, part of the whole relationships go, as we know, go back to Vitruvius. And, uh, but I would like to point out that even there they get complicated because a, the parts of a column are base, shaft, and capital. That doesn't address anything like its component construction, which are these lozenges. So when you read about the proportional systems or the harmonic systems, it's not about the pieces that are building it, it's about already a rhetorical figure. And in fact, there's anathyrosis. Does any of y'all know what anathyrosis is? It was a trick the Greeks used. So as the Greeks were learning to build, they would carve this down and then they would put a dowel in here. And so there are ideas of how to build in the Greek columns that you never know about and that are really about the relationship between component construction and the result and the rhetorical figure of the column. This is why, if I can take a moment and try this one more time, I would like to show you the end result of this thinking, uh, which I tried this morning. I think I, for $2.50 I solved the problem. Play. Sound, please. Oh, all right. That's probably going to be a little too loud. Anyway, these are two writers from England who have come to the United States to make a make a TV show in Los Angeles. They're going into a guest house. This is just for the two of us. <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> Our show's not this good. <laughs> Front door ajar. Front door ajar. She is fun. Front door ajar. Bloody hell. It's even bigger inside. And you were afraid we weren't going to have enough staircases. This is mad. Oi! <laughs> Look at this. It's very Hollywood. Yeah. A construction wire.
You can thank Peter Eisner for that. <laughs> and so, if there is some interest in building and interested in the behavior of uh, things in such a way as not to simply be a rhetorical figure. Now, remember that the, because they're deciding they're, they're using a linguistic model to approach the problem of, um, who would, oh, this next slide, sorry. A linguistic model to approach the problem of architecture. They are actually looking down on the West Coast. They, they think that the part to whole relationship issue or the component construction issue is just dead. It's a word, it it's belongs to a late 19th century, early 20th century, pre-Corbusian question of architecture. And so there is a kind of contempt on the East Coast for, for the wor work that's going on here. Um, and I, I think it's really important to acknowledge. Um, now, another figure of the, however, not all of the figures on the East Coast are a part of the New York Times. This is one I think that sort of stands out a little bit. It is a rhetorical argument. It's a late work by John Haydick. Uh, but it has a powerful effect in a way that I think I would just like to call your attention to. This is the mother of the suicide, house of the mother of the suicide. Uh, when you see this, it's virtually impossible not to look at this form work as having a deep poetry and a profound, I don't know, sensibility. Can you see the little spikes that stick out of the side? I just want to, why I'm showing you this is probably not clear right now, but then uh, if you see the angel catcher and you see rebar. So there was more, I don't know, commonality and, and relationship among the two schools that I think are worth paying attention to as we call attention to how important the differences were, because I think they're formative in Eric's thinking. The whole time Peter was here, he was saying stuff like, that guy doesn't even think about building. That guy doesn't even know how to build. You know, look at that. I mean, I, he kept pointing at stuff like, I was supposed to know what he was talking about, but look at that something or another. Oh, there's the missing slide. It just, uh, so this is the exercise that I mentioned earlier for the DAEP. Okay, now, I, so I'm trying to think. You know, I have to come up, I study the work, we go through, I go through all the work. I have to come up with some conjectures about what it is, uh, what is going on in, in uh, Eric's work. There is a common assumption that he has a real interest in violence. Um, that he seems not only to contest uh, issues in argument and to constantly he loves debate, but he seems to present his work in terms of a kind of pleasure in violence, which I don't think is true, but you can see in, in the pterodactyl, for example, um, it, you can see the, these are the slides that he likes to show in association with it. Now we'll return to this. Bondage. And I thought, is this what this is about? You know, is, is, will I, was the solution to be a kind of opening the door to a kind of discourse of violence, an explicit discourse of violence in architecture? He even hung the original construction manager at the, uh, I don't know if you know this. So he had this, he had this guy lynched. Um, anyway, y'all probably already know this story. Now, before I, uh, uh, I, just to return to the question of Freud for a moment, there's a remarkable uh, piece of history that I don't think that many people know about. It's not really an important part of intellectual history and psychology. But if, if in 1812, as Peter taught us, um, theory becomes part of architectural discourse, by 1896, Wolflin is no longer, he, he's rejecting the idea of an art historian or being an art, histori being an art historian or being um, an art theorist, and he, d he identifies himself as a psychologist. So in 1896, he is the first person to say the problem of art theory and architecture theory is to understand the relationship of the work of art to psychology and in particular to the developing self. And he says that what architecture is, is the, is the art form in which we learn about our bodies in all of their depth and integrity and complexity as places, uh, it's often translated as spirit, but it's clear because he's not talking about religion, he means mind. It's a better translation to say, 
as of a developing mind. And so we get to know our minds more by getting to know our bodies through architecture more. And I think that's a profound insight. It's the one that guides my thinking mostly. I think it's gonna have a lot to do with Eric's work. Um, and, but I think what I think is super is he wrote this in 1896. And the example he gives is that the, it's in the book Renaissance and Baroque. The Renaissance is very interested in part to whole relationships, consinity relationships, how this proportion proportions to that, how this relates to that, the size of the hand in relationship to the size of the arm all of the harmonic ratios that you know. The Baroque, on the other hand, is interested in the holistic connections, like where does my hand end and my arm begin? And he sees that as a completely new formation of the body having to do with mass and part, I mean, pieces. He's now talking about fragments of the body, no longer parts in their relationships. Four years later, Freud, is in studying hypnosis with Charcot in Paris, and he comes up with one of the most brilliant insights in the entire history of intellectual life, so brilliant that the poet Auden said it was the greatest insight into humanity ever made. And what he noticed was that people with real his paralyses of the arm, then these arm, these two muscles atrophy. I'm sorry, if you have a real paralysis of your hand and you cannot use your hand, these two muscles atrophy and, and fail because they are really belong to the hand. These are the muscles that control the rotational movements and up and down movements of the hand. So any uh, anatomist will always identify these two muscles as belonging to the hand. They're not arm muscles. If you have a hysterical paralysis of the hand, and you can identify hysterical paralysis of the hand in hypnosis because occasionally you can cause it to go away temporarily, then these two muscles do not atrophy which means that the thing that's paralyzed is not the hand, but the word hand, or the idea of the hand. And he has this, and it's a very famous insight, and you can tell why Auden was so enthusiastic about it, because actually it gave poetry a certain purpose. But Wolflin had already made the argument in terms of Renaissance and Baroque four years earlier. So, I'm listening to Eric, and I, you know, he's in Ohio State, and I'm trying to get some grasp on this, and I'm studying the work, and something happens at Ohio State, uh, and I want you to hear it. During one point of his conversation, Eric says, he's looking, uh, maybe I should show you a picture. Uh, let's just pretend, I'm not quite, I really don't quite know, but let's say he's looking at this, uh, project, this building, okay? And he's talking to the students about this building. And then he says this. So in, in this case, the, the, what, what it looks like is that, that the trusses, as they were understood operationally, in support and in spanning that long space, were defined in a different way so that they didn't necessarily operate at that scale. They weren't, used, they weren't necessarily to be used upside down or right side up or in the way that they were used before. So it, in, in a sense, it's like uh, being given an alphabet and maybe the letters stay the same, but the language and the words that you're making are not entirely recognizable, but they're recognizable enough because when you return to the origin, you can still recognize the letters. And I have to say I like that because I, I, I think there's something in, in the discussion we were having this morning that has to do with, with do we know more is more ahead of us Okay, now, I'm gonna play that again, but while I'm playing it, I would, if, let me see if I can get these two things on at the same time. I would like you to take a look at this. Um, there must be some. How do I do full screen? View, full screen. Okay, this, is the first page of James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. And if you'll read through it, you'll see very odd uses of words and letters and languages, even to the point like the art, theatric, Venison, even this, which is a hundred 
hundred letter long word called a thunder word. The book that starts in the middle of a sentence and it ends with the sentence that it starts with, so it kind of keeps going. It's, just, it's based on Vico's theories of history. And so I thought, oh my God, that's the answer. I'm going to be able to account for Eric's work as a kind of Joycean kind of architecture. And if you listen, let's see if I can get this going. I think it's actually, I don't know, how do I do this? How do I do this? So in, in this case, the, the, what, what it looks like is that, that the trusses, as they were understood operationally, in support and in spanning that long space, were defined in a different way so that they didn't necessarily operate at that scale. They weren't, used, they weren't necessarily to be used upside down or right side up or in the way that they were used before. So it, in, in a sense, it's like uh, being given an alphabet and maybe the letters stay the same, but the language and the words that you're making are not entirely recognizable, but they're recognizable enough because when you return to the origin, you can still recognize the letters. I have to say I like that because I... Now, up I, to I that think point, so I think I've nailed it. Don't you? Doesn't that exactly look like that? I think, okay, I finally solved the problem of Eric Moss. I'm done. But then he says this. It's a little disturbing. He didn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> I used to be much better at these. He said something really important. I want you to hear it. So in, in entirely recognizable, but they're recognizable enough because when you return to the origin, you can still recognize the letters. I have to say I like that because I, I, I think there's something in, in the discussion we were having this morning that has to do with with do we know more is more ahead of us? Do we know a smaller piece and don't know a bigger piece? Or do we know almost everything there is to know and the remainder is a relatively small piece that we just need to fill in? So I think that there is something in, in the thinking of the, the making of these buildings it has to do with that tension about what we know and what we don't know or what might be understandable and what might be less understandable. And, and I think if you go back to the, to the Marco Polo quote, the capacity to, to, to listen rather than for what you know, to listen for what you haven't heard yet. And this is, this is a way of, of thinking about putting pieces together and what pieces in what way and making space which is, which is not entirely an unrecognizable space nor is it entirely a recognizable space. So it seems to be more a tension between possibilities than a definitive solution. Okay. So... There was something wrong with my analysis, my, uh, my insight, or my epiphany. Because Eric starts to talk about, do we know pretty much everything and there's a little bit more to go, or we just add a few more decimal points, or do we know pretty much nothing? And it's clear, I think, that he thinks we know, he prefers the side that we know pretty much nothing. Um, or we're much at the lower end of what we're going to learn than at the higher end. Now, why that doesn't work with Joyce is Joyce is profoundly in control of what he's doing. So when you read this book, all of those word plays have to do with two things. He's going to tell three stories at the same time. He's going to tell the entire history of the world. He's going to tell the entire history of the world through a Vicovian model of history, which cycles, and every time it goes through its four cycles, there's a thunderclap, and the thunderclap is the four, plus he's going to tell four years in the life of an Irish bartender. So in order to do that, every letter, every word is perfectly in control. This is not the work of a contingent self, nor is this a work about contingency in the self. This is a work of a self in profound control. And I thought, this is a mistake. 
I can't use this. Uh, but when it's that good, you have to show it anyway. <laughs> Take credit for all your work. So I had to come up with another model. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I have to work personally. I need a model of thinking as I'm working. I, I, it can come from art, it can come from science, it can come from music, it can come from any of my interests, it can come from other architectural history. But I need to think, okay, what he's doing here is Wolf, Plip, Wolf Pricks plus Tom Main minus Stephen Hall with a dash of uh, uh, Aram Saroyan or a dash of, uh, what's the guy's name with the floating leaves? I mean, the poetry would, E.E. Uh, e. Cummings. Um, so I th it occurred to me, as I started about the letter argument, that what about Bruce Nauman? Now, Bruce Nauman is an incredibly interesting artist. Bruce Nauman, I think, if you had to pick, set out a succession, you would probably start with uh, Pollock. You would then go to Rauschenberg and um, Johns. And then from Rauschenberg to Johns, you would go to Warhol. And then, from, and then the person who sums all that up together, I think, is Bruce Nauman. Why that's so interesting is that Pollock is about um, knowing, in a certain sense, the status of the mark. The irrational status of the mark is, an, is existentially confirming, meaning any mark I make on a canvas today is enough to be art. But it, ha it, ha it cannot have purpose, it cannot have signification, it has to be a pure irrational mark. Rauschenberg, Johns, and uh, Warhol work out the problem of what's the relationship to that between, between the idea of uh, the mark and the received language that we all need to have. We're not actually existentially uh, based, we're not just our actions and choices, we're products. We're products of our language, we're products of our upbringing, we're products just like the Warhol can as a product. Bruce Nauman conceived an idea of just his passage through the world, touching stuff and leaving an index of its contingency as he moves through it. So he had the idea that whatever I do is art. Whatever I do in the studio is actually the quote, whatever I do in the studio is art. But he didn't have to have a theory of, an existential theory of the mark. He didn't have to have a theory of productive products. All he had to do was act, and the act would simply, would not be confirming. It would not confirm the, quality, the value of an existential life. It would simply mark the passage of one person through the world, leave a trace, knowing full well that others will mark, pass through it, and that became a model for me. And it's actually, I wanted to end, I wanted to give you the ending of the lecture as early as I could. I'm 15 minutes into the lecture. That's going to be my conclusion. Everything else is me trying to kind of show you some pictures of it. This is Bruce. Uh, this is as if he walked by a neon sign and just that happened. And so that also, I think, matches the letter's argument of Eric. The violin, I mean, much of this is really famous, the violence and violins, neons. This is the reassembled, uh, horse, which he does quite a bit. He just takes the pieces and moves them somewhere else. <laughs> and so that is my model. And, the model, and that's the model I wanted to, uh, for the contingent self. Um, when the students were reading Eric's work, they noticed that he, was, he published something called Gnostic Architecture. And so we looked into Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, as many of you don't know, <coughs> is a second, <laughs> second century heretical Christian period in which the idea that there was such a thing as secret knowledge. One could, one could have expert secret knowledge about the life of Christ and the teachings of Christ that were not available to you unless you had a specific kind of anointment. In fact, uh, the book of Judas, there was a book in the Bible written called the Book of Judas, was prohibited from being considered in the Bible by the enclave, of the 16th century enclave, I think, because there was a, it, it argued that there was a secret plan between Jesus and Judas to have Judas sell Jesus out. And the, the Catholics are, the Catholic, uh, the 
the encyclical argued that there can be no secret knowledge, no Gnostic knowledge. And so we were thinking, D is this true? Is this, does Eric know something about uh, architecture or does he put something in there that only architects might know? Is he actually building architects for a kind of Gnosticism within architecture? And we argue, we end up arguing the answer being no, but there was a kind of Gnosticism in the work, but not for a specific kind of knowledge of architects. Um, Eric made a really interesting point when he was talking to us about, uh, when he was growing up about the, the political upheavals in the 60s that he went through in school. And he kept noticing something about crowds. There would be crowds uh, on, a, on the campuses cause, you know, we get out of the war, let's get out of the war. And, uh, you know, no ROTC on campus, et cetera. Freedom of speech, don't tell us how to, you know, we can't, don't make us be in the ROTC. All kinds of conflicts. And he, and he noticed that once a crowd forms, even if it has a good political point, it speaks with a kind of crowd voice. And it's speaking against authority, which already speaks with an institutionalized voice. And so there's no real conversation. There's no real discussion. There's polemic debate. And he, was, he clearly seemed to want to make a place in the world for what happens instead of us arguing with each other. But let's say I say this and someone else says that and someone else says that. We actually have a discussion. And it's why I realized that there was a kind of relationship between Eric's work and Bruce Nallen's work to the Greek notion of agon. Agon is a contest, but it's a contest between two athletes. It's not a contest between two groups or it's a contest between individuals, and it can be a physical contest, it can be a debate. It's a kind of never-ending fight that has very specific rules, that you had to adhere to the specific rules. And, but the point of it was not the winning and losing, but the working out of the possibilities of the argument within the context of those rules. And so Agon plus Neumann gives you Eric. Now we can quit right now because that's my conclusion, at least that's my working hypothesis. Um, I, you know as well as I do that Eric will drive you crazy with his perspectivalism. The minute you say something's true, he will find another perspective and say, yeah, what about this? You know, well, how do you know? Who says that's right? Uh, that's a door. How do you know it's a door? Uh, I remember the debate. Uh, Tom May was really mad at Eric for not lining up the screws in the metal piece he did in the gallery. Remember this? And he said, you didn't even, you didn't even orient the screws. You, know, you, didn't pay, you used to really pay attention to that stuff. You know, why didn't you do it? And Eric said, how do you know I didn't? How do you know that's not what I meant to do? You know, it was just constantly that. So I, I dug this slide up. Sanford Quinter showed it at the last thesis thing. I just, you know. And this is not just perspectivalism between teams. This is the perspectivalisms of species. So in the upper right hand corner is a room from the point of view of a dog. It's like the dog, like here's the room, sorry, I gotta walk away. Here's the room from the point of view of a human being. They're kind of interested in everything. The dog is not interested in the books, the dresser, they're only interested in where the butt is in and the food. So that's their reality. And then in the lower right hand corner is the, that same room from the point of view of a fly. Fly doesn't give a damn where the butt's been. Then all it cares about is where the lamp is and the place where the food is. And I thought that's actually an incredibly important, that's a Nietzschean idea, that there will, oh, there's no such thing as a truth that, can, that cannot be defeated by a, a recontextualization of perspective. So just quickly some work. Now, l this morning and last night we talked about the corner problem. You cannot understand Eric's work without corners. In fact, 100% of his work, I would say, uh, touches on the corner, and I'd say 80% of it ends on the corner. That has to do with his part to whole relationship uh, issue in the sense that in, in, if you are working in rhetorical figures or if you're working in a linguistic model, you can't pick your favorite part of the building. You cannot use the, what's called the 90-10 club in my school. You can't say 90% of it's gonna be sort of quotidian and banal, and I'm gonna give it to you know, normal behavior and not spend much money. I'm gonna take 30% of the budget, and I'm gonna excite one piece of it. And you, you, you can't do that. But in, in the kind of thinking that I think developed here and produced an incredible architecture, you can do that. And one of the best places to do it is the corner. And so Eric is a classic example 
of the development of the corner problem, which is why I asked, I asked Peter last night, what's the state of the corner problem? So this is just what he does. And then you're gonna find something there. And you know, there's one of the corners. Oh, now, this is a, my, my perspective on Eric's corners, because they're not just corners. They have a strong and powerful ornamental quality. So this is Kent Bloomer's ornaments uh, for the Chicago Library. So if you look at that, look at that, I see the same thing. Not only that, if you look really closely at that, it looks like those monsters in the mummies where the thing actually turns around, or in the Transformers. You can see it's looking at them. It walks up, turns around, stares right at them, says, stop, or I'm gonna eat you. Uh, this being a place where people were supposed to sit around and listen to people sitting in there playing music. <laughs> Before, we could easily do booleans. Eric was working out by hand incongruent booleans between three-dimensional forms. So he would suck out a cube out of a corner or suck out you know, any, uh, stuff. You know this as well as I do. Uh, you can see one there, or you can see several there. The easiest thing in the world to do now on a computer. Um, and that's why I think he made a really brilliant point, and that is it actually depends. He said this yesterday. It depends when you do this. Like when he did the slump glass work um, and was in a sort of a contest with Frank Gehry, who was doing uh, a project for Cyan, I mean, for the new houses in New York, um, it was really hard to do. And he, he broke it and it's all sorts of stuff. You know this at the, at the uh, umbrella. Now it's pretty easy to do. There are manufacturers that can sell it to you. You can buy, you can actually order the parts. So it does matter when you do something. And it matters because also the difficulty will be present in the work. So these are various corners that I thought were interesting. This is one of my favorite projects. Um, this is the IRS uh, recording studio, which I think I've already showed a little bit about. I, you know, with the, I made an allusion to the co-op Himmelblau. What I think is really interesting about this is the question of Gnosticism is, I think I can make it, does everybody know the trick in this project? Because Eric sometimes is embarrassed about this project. He always apologizes. He always says stuff like, it's clever in an IQ sense, as if that's a bad thing. Jeff, you're clever in an IQ sense. Uh-oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because <laughs> um, here's the trick. And once I show it to you, it will ruin it for you. And that became something really important to us. What you're seeing here is the degree to which he indulges a kind of banality or, or acceptable level of normality in most of the project. This is most of the project. So there's a kind of, there's a little staircase there, weird doors. This is one of the rooms. That whole project is right up there. And here's the trick. I'm just curious. If you know this project and you know the trick, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Raise your hand if you know the trick. So I see two people that know the trick. So I am about to ruin this project for you. Just utterly ruin it for you. Okay, watch. Oh, and then, uh, so look at this thing. Let me find, where is my picture of it? Where is my picture? Did I show the logo? Oh, yeah. Where's the picture? Oh, yeah. So look at this figure. And then look at this figure right there. And you see the face? <laughs> I mean, it's not just sort of there. It's there. <laughs> and you will never get it out of your head, <laughs> which is why my students and I are convinced he put this thing in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, look at that. And so is that secret? <laughs> I, like I tell you, I'm actually done. The rest of this is just holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. I had 700 slides this morning. It's down to 200 now. I'm a, I won't show them all. I'll skip stuff. I kept thinking, oh, I can't take Marinsky out. Like, it's so great, it's so great, it's so great. Um, now, one thing else you'll notice is whenever you see a project of Eric published, you will not find a human being in it. Not one. Um, I had to put my own students in. These are examples of... Uh, of uh, hell, I forgot. 
Now, what I believe is this is this. He just finally decided to do it. Wait, now that's what it looks like from bo the bottom. So it does have a place where it goes away. Uh, had you seen that before, Andrew? It sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> it's really fantastic. Um, so, but also, he, this, the, uh, the tower actually is looking right at it. I mean, if you walk upstairs, it's going to have to be fantastic. Now, th these pro like this project, this is the Beehive project, I think. Yes. Is this Beehive? Yes. Is exactly this project, but in an, you see the pyramid here? You see the um, Boolean down spaces? This is project and this project are virtually identical. See the pyramid here, and, uh, but in solid void reversal. He has an incredible, he works and works and works, repeats himself over and over again, not to repeat himself, not, not as an act of self-plagiarism, but as an act of finding the agon, finding the context, and making sure that when you, he passes through his projects, they're constantly and permanently unsettled. And permanently unsettled, I think, is the state of the contingent self. And the question I keep asking myself is, should, can we do this in architecture? And I'm more and more concluding that Eric, that Eric has shown that we can do this in architecture. The question is, should we do this in architecture? Is this, is making architecture show other ourselves as constantly contingent by putting ourselves in a permanent state of, um, contest, a permanent state of unsettlement. Oh, I had so, so these are the Boolean. I mean, I have so much to say about this that I just, I, I don't really want to bore you. Let me get to this point really quickly. Eric cares a lot about building, but he didn't, he could care less about being honest. Um, he's not about showing the honesty of the building. This is part wood, part concrete, painted to be one thing. So to disguise the wood and the concrete into a kind of matte nothingness, but not to make it abstract in the sense of figure or trope, but to make it abstract in the sense of undecidable. Uh, I'll show you, this is the beehive analysis. These are my, some of my students, or they're require, all required to do analysis, and so this was one. So one of my students became convinced that uh, this comes from a hairdo that he <laughs> discovered. So, so this is the Boolean. Watch this. <laughs> the things we can do. I asked them to look for various relationships to other projects. I thought this was quite beautiful. So the consistency is probably more profound in a certain way than I think any of the other architects I've showed you. It's, this, it's just worked over and over and over again. It does, I think, meet the Nauman model. Uh, I don't wanna, I'm not gonna belabor this too much longer, but uh, this is this project. Is this project upside down? <laughs> Which is, I think we heard earlier him talking about. He has an obsession with upside down trusses. He has an obsession with, you know, you know it's, I don't need to do this for you because you can do it for yourself. That many people found interesting relationships between the, the Fred and Ginger. I think this is, you know, this is probably, this is the project that I once said, I didn't think it was possible to torture a building. So I didn't think there could be such a thing as morality of architecture. Having seen this project, <laughs> I. I concluded that it was actually possible to torture a building <laughs> and that we should probably have a certain morality about this. Um, so I could spend a lot of time identifying for you the same exact elements used over and over and over again, how they're put into a figural relationship, their attitude about the corner. All of this is at Culver City. Now this morning, Joe said, boy, I, I can't wait to, uh, with Joe Day, I'm sorry, he said, you know, I can't wait to what you're going to say tonight. I, he said, Culver City has really reached a critical mass. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I, I'm sorry, uh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I've been studying this stuff for weeks and weeks and months. I never even thought about the whole thing. You know, I never even considered, I don't care about, 
I like buildings. I look at buildings one building at a time. I, don't, I see their relationships to other buildings. But it's what he said is absolutely true. It has now become a thing, but it's not become a thing that he made. It's become a thing of all these little, they're not parts. I don't even know what to talk about them about. They're episodes. And I think this might be my favorite. Um, now, why slump glass? Why slump glass at the Marinsky? Why slump glass at the, um, in New York, at, the, at Queens? Uh, the promise of slump glass was two things, I think. And the reason there was so much excitement about it, and if you look at uh, Frank's building at Condi, Frank's little cafe at Condé Nast, you'll see another version of it. The idea was it would, could be beautifully form, beautiful form or a compelling form plus have the pleasures of transparency. Once you slump it, you lose all the pleasures of transparency. You get this. And the quantity of tectonics necessary to get it up is so overwhelming that you lose all the sculptural possibilities. And so, frankly, I think this began and ended the project, my, for me, of slump glass, uh, in the sense that all of its allure disappeared with, with its success. Um, yet he's kept working on it over, these are the relationships. Ter this is, I'm like, I won't do all. Pterodactyl I think is incredibly interesting because it looks like it's about the weight. He's put, you know, you've seen this thing, it sits on there, but it's the only project I know that he renders in material like Eisenman. This is, all about is making this as light as it possibly can be, even though the, all, everything about it is an intensity of weight and contest, and yet it's almost not there. It, it's, it looks a bit like uh, just a decorated shed. And I, it's because he's interested, even the contest within his own contest. Uh, then, the one other thing I'm gonna say about him, uh, I'm gonna show a couple of projects just for the fun of it. Like, work, 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 same stuff over and over again, reassembled, 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 and then out of nowhere springs. You know, you would be hard pressed to figure out where these fucking springs come from. He, every time he tells a story of a building that he's, um, you know, springs in Kazakhstan, it was a cause of earthquakes, and it turned out the springs made it worse, you know. So does he get rid of the springs? No. He just figures out how to make earthquakes work in springs. Then, and I, I think this is an incredibly beautiful project. Springs in uh, Montreal. Now look at, let's see, see the spring? Goes from down there, then turns up. So it's no longer, I mean, what is it? It produces this kind of walking man figure. Um, he just decided to add springs for the next, I don't know, it's like Bruce. Here's more springs. <laughs> and so this walking man figure now, but once he starts to add the figure, he makes the works go back and have a conversation with his other works. So I think the walking man figure from Montreal has a wonderful relationship to the Samatar and it's, and it's um, attitude about meeting the ground and materiality. And then it actually shows up, I think, in uh, this project, which you probably haven't seen. This was his competition entry to the Angavanta. Uh, I think an extraordinary uh, competition entry. We'll look at it for a little bit and then I'll let you go. And so invitingly rendered. You, wouldn't you think? Don't you think chemical waste dust? Uh, and a post-apocalyptic cloud is exactly what I would want for my school. Guaranteed to win a competition. Anyway, here's the competition quickly. Now, there, there's just dozens and dozens of sketches of every project. You'll see that the theme here is three birds on a, str on a string. You can see them. So those, those three elements are the three birds. It has a wonderful diagram of fixing a problem that the building doesn't have. He argues that the building <laughs> has a dead end. He shows a diagram, I don't show it, maybe I'll show it to you here. He shows a diagram where the, the old building, the original building, you go in this, go over there, come out, and you hit a dead end, and you can't connect, and so he's gonna connect. 
What he means is you can't connect inside. You can just walk out the door, walk the 20 feet, and walk, connect, and you're fine. Um, so it's one of those uh, Queen's Museum models. Um, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but I think what's incredible are these figures. So the idea really is he adds, I think I shoot myself in the laser a few times, he adds a lot of programming and materiality to a, what, an existingly bad modern building. This is an This is the existing. This is the Mac. Uh, part this is the Mac Museum, and so and then he what he's going to do is add program there, um, change the entry, which is this front entry I think I showed you already, right here. And then he's going to float these three elements on what everybody agrees was. So I can show you a picture of it. So these are the bridges. These are the three elements he's floating. And he's going to be floating it on one of Tom Maine's land things. There it is. See Tom Maine's? <laughs> so he, uh, um, but these are completely out of character, I thought. These are, these are so Hadic like it made me, that's why I introduced the question of Hadic. They have a kind of enigmatic figure out. They, they don't seem like Eric Moss to me. And as I started to study it more and more, I thought, you know, why is that? Why are these the beautiful model? Uh, and these are, so these are the three birds on a, on a wire, the bridges that hold them up. He was asked to do one tectonic solution by Arab, I believe, and uh, declined and worked out a completely different set of how these things are held up. Um, now, I had just, uh, I had just written before this competition about Peter Nerova for Eric, and I call attention to these four heads. So this is no longer Bruce Nam. These are Franz West lemur heads, and I think they're the most politically effective work of art I've ever seen. You cross this bridge every time, they, and you see these heads just floating there. And they, plus, in heavy weather, they turn. So the next day you come, and sometimes they're talking to each other, like this one is talking to this one. No, this one's got his head back, and sometimes they're not. And it is a perfect model, I think, of the agnosticism of, of social life towards one another. And uh, everybody in Vienna hates it. They've been trying to get these things taken down for 10 years. Peter Nerva kept them there by sheer will. They'll probably be coming down soon. So I thought, I was convinced that, uh, at least for me personally, that Eric's uh, birds on a wire relate to these things, and that those things that just came out of nowhere. But then I looked really carefully, and there it was. Uh, I think I'll just skip this project. This, was the, this is his worst project. I was <laughs> and I was going to end on a sort of... I mean, this is a, the Hayden Towers project. It's quite beautiful, but has many of the themes. These are the upside down trusses that he spe was speaking of. Maybe this was actually what he was showing when he was talking about the letters. Um, all of the kinds of uh, contest and reassembly, the sort of Nauman plus Agon model, uh, a trust that can't hold anything up. Um, then all of a sudden, this thing couldn't be built for years and years and years and uh, for budget reasons and all sorts of reasons. And finally, it comes back online, and he changes the project. And he changes the project into a kind of stack of, like, this becomes, for me, is this part to whole, or is this rhetorical figure, or what is this? Plus, he sets up a kind of dialectic between one, of the built, one tower and the other tower. So one tower is the stack of paper tower, and one tower is the cactus tower. And I find this, this project leaves me quite flat. It's dialectics, it's this or that. Compared to this, um, I, I find it slightly anemic. But I also know something else. Uh, this will turn into a new adventure. This will become unstable, destabilized, repeated over and over again. He will use this project until he gets it right, or not until he gets it right, until he gets it, until he's satisfied with it, and, which will never happen. And then uh, I guess this is the last line. Oh yeah, that's Eric. That's, 
You want to know what Eric Owen Moss is? It's that stuff. Okay, thank you.